Thank you for joining us today as we launch the Johns Hopkins India Institute and welcome our esteemed guest and collaborator, Dr. Cyrus Punawa. The Johns Hopkins India Institute is a major step forward in solidifying and indeed enhancing our partnerships with colleagues in India. I am so excited and proud to have the opportunity today to speak with Dr. Cyrus Punawala, Chairman and Founder of the Serum Institute of India and recipient of this year's Dean's Medal from the Bloomberg School. The Dean's Medal is the school's highest honor reserved for outstanding public health researchers and practitioners who demonstrate exceptional leadership in their fields, safeguarding and improving the public's health. And I can't think of anyone more deserving of this honor than Dr. Punawala. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Punwala uh, founded, founded the Serum Institute in 1966 and has led it to a leadership position in the field of vaccine development with a particular focus on pediatric vaccines. Using an innovative approach focused on scale combined with a dedication to low cost access, the Serum Institute has been able to deliver vaccines on a vast scale. It has protected more than two thirds of a global infant population, resulting in an estimated saving of 30 million lives, which otherwise would have certainly been lost. And this is because there are no alternative low cost vaccines available at that time in the numbers required for protection of the global population. Dr. Punwala has always been committed to collaboration and the Serum Institute partnered early on with UNICEF and a Pan American Health Organization. It is estimated that the measles vaccine supplied by the Institute to UNICEF and PAHO between 1990 and 2016 averted some 22 million deaths. Today, Serum is the world's largest producer of vaccines by number of doses, producing more than 1.5 billion doses a year of life-saving vaccines used in over 170 countries to combat many infectious diseases, including polio, rotavirus, rabies, measles, mumps, rubella, pertussis, tetanus, just to name a few. And of course, as, we, um, as you have uh, probably heard, the Serum Institute, under Dr. Panwala's leadership, is partnering with Oxford University, the Gates Foundation, Gavi Vaccine Alliance, and AstraZeneca, as well as Novavax, to manufacture and distribute millions of doses of a novel coronavirus vaccine, once one is shown to be efficacious. We are counting on you, Dr. Panwala, for saving us from the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, no pressure. Dr. Panwala, thank you so very much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. I'm uh, overwhelmed with the compliments that you have uh, um, talked about uh, my contribution to public health. Uh, now I'm at your service to give uh, any response to specific questions that you may have. So I want to start with a little bit about your background. Uh, you are known for your amazing success in establishing the Serum Institute, uh, which now provides vaccines for 60% of the world's children. And I know, I'm sure you have over, you've had to overcome some enormous challenges in doing so. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey? And is it true that you started with a horse farm? Yes. Um, you know, when I, I graduated, uh, uh, you know, I must uh, confess that I was only a, a commerce graduate and not a scientist. And that was quite strange for all the regulators when they were meeting me in these earlier days uh, before I got a doctorate. Uh, and having said that, my interest, a family interest was real estate and horse breeding. And in a socialist country like India, I thought that it wouldn't be appropriate to uh, build my career uh, in that uh, uh, line of business, though I didn't give it up. I'm still very passionate about my horses uh, and uh, so on. But the, I was talking to one of the veterinary surgeons there and I said, hey, what will I going to do uh, in this country? I want to do something which will deal with the masses. And he said, look, I've got a great idea. And it was a chance talk one evening over a, a cup of coffee. And he said, we're donating our horses 
for making anti-snake venom and anti-tetanus serum to the world famous Hafkin Institute in Bombay. Why don't you put up a small uh, process plant okay. and uh, use these uh, equines uh, because you've got a farm, Glaxo and others are making tetanus vaccine now here, but they don't have a, a farm to uh, you know expand in the business of making life-saving uh, immunobiologicals from equines because uh, it requires a huge estate. Uh -huh. Having said that, that was the seed uh, which finally has succeeded today and uh, I immediately looked around and I was lucky to have run across the uh, just immediate uh, retired director of Hapkin Institute and uh, some friends got us together and I rushed down to Bombay with him, contacted several scientists who were very kind uh, to me and uh, wholeheartedly helped me in you know, uh, joining uh, a very small company which I floated with a capital of $25,000 mm. uh, called Serum Institute of India. I gave a very big name, the former director there was very angry. He said, how do you become Serum Institute of India when I'm uh, the African <laughs> director? <laughs> And I said, that's a visionary decision I've taken and I hope that I will justify the rape, uh, uh, faith reposed in that name. Uh, of course, now my friends are telling me to change it to Serum International. But uh, <laughs> for sentimental reasons in lighter way, my uh, scientists say stick with what has been lucky for you. Yeah. So having said that, that has how the uh, whole... Uh, process started and uh, of course we'll uh, explore the whole story as we go around to your uh, questions hereafter. Yeah, it's an, it's an amazing story. Um, it's, it's great to hear. So how did, um, you, know, you talked a little bit about how serum moved from manufacturing just a single vaccine and that was the tetanus vaccine. Um, how did how did you move from that stage to providing childhood vaccines to 60% of the world's children? And why the tetanus vaccine? Why did you start with a tetanus va vaccine? Yeah, so uh, uh, this is an easy one to answer because if we had to make tetanus antitoxin serum, which was hugely in shortage and thousands of people were dying, even pregnant mothers were die, uh, having affected with new tetanus uh, because of mortality to their infant children. Um, tetanus was obviously the first choice. I, in fact, remember just going in, in my car uh, to fetch the tetanus uh, toxoid first to immunize our horses to, from Bombay to Pune. So we immediately decided to go to step two, that is to put up a small uh, unit to make tetanus uh, toxin for immunizing the equines and tetanus toxoid. Mm -hmm. Again, I must, at the cost of repetition, say that millions of people were saved, the children and others, because there was a huge shortage of tetanus toxoid. Uh -huh. So it was antitoxin, toxoid, although I must confess that we were not the pioneers in making tetanus toxoid attack. There were many uh, public sector undertakings in India, but there... I'm grateful to them, <laughs> ironically, for their failure, total failure mm. in providing the, uh, the vaccine and the anti-serum, though they had the infrastructure and the backing of government. And that's how, on the back of the, the shortage, we were able to grow very rapidly. So the first product that was made was tetanus toxoid, tetanus antitoxin, uh, later on followed by tetanus and as, uh, ASVS for uh, uh, anti-snake venom. Mm -hmm. And to answer your next question, having tasted this success, there was no point in the company only growing on tetanus. So naturally we immediately looked for all the vaccines that were in shortage and were being imported or were donated by UNICEF. The next obvious product was DPT. Mm -hmm. And after DPT came all the other po uh, products uh, uh, that followed BCG, which was in great uh, shortage that time. Though, before we entered, the country was almost self-sufficient with public sector 
BCG manufacturing companies, which again fell a victim to incompetence. And uh, so we were able to step in in their shoes and produce uh, a BCG vaccine, which now India, or I say Serum Institute, is providing 80% of world's children uh, with BCG vaccine. And now this COVID uh, epidemic, a lot of propagation is there and we are on a major a clinical trial sponsored by government of India to see whether to some extent it, it does prevent uh, uh, the COVID uh, uh, infection. And that's going to be a major, major issue uh, for Serum Institute to, to take up. And I'll talk about it perhaps later on. But after this, to be as brief as possible, pentavalent vaccine, hepatitis, uh, and all the other vaccines that followed, yes, one of the major uh, fortunate incidences of uh, success here was measles. Uh, India was suffering from huge measles. Uh, uh, they had nearly, nearly half a million uh, or more children dying annually of measles. The global figure was 1.2 uh, million children annually dying of uh, measles. Uh, it could have been much more, but you know we are going by estimated published uh, reports. And uh, one thing I must stress to the audience today that all data, especially coming from developing countries, and that's been my very, very strong view from the beginning, are uh, underquoted, underestimated, mm. because there could be uh, so many people, including in COVID now, don't want to report, mm. don't want to come forward uh, and admit that there's or their families are suffering from the disease. So the yeah. disease burden in developing countries is far more than what you have in the United States where the diligent uh, reporting is done. So this is a very important takeaway from the audience that even though we talk about, say, 1.8 million, million people dying, children dying of various communicable disease vaccine uh, provided now protected by vaccines, the figure could be far in excess. Mm. I had success, uh, brief success, as the, as the English phrase goes, and uh, uh, suffice it to say that from one vaccine to the other, we have kept on um, and now extrapolating to all vaccines required by UNICEF and the world, including pneumococcal, rotavirus, and we are also looking at uh, developing a vaccine for dengue and uh, Mm, HIV, HIV, HIV to some extent uh -huh. if we can and it uh -huh. be one thing I must stress that we have believed in, not in fundamental research which would have taken us years uh, like uh, other companies uh, in the world who have the money power and the resources to do development we have we gone in for my policies applied research find out like for example there was a clone available for rabies uh, in the Massachusetts school and the, 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 we took that technology and then we extrapolated the, the feed, seed virus and developed uh, the first time in the world a rabies immunoglobulin which can be now given for uh, uh, immediate neutralization <clears throat> of the virus without side effects of using an equine serum which causes a lot of reaction. So mm -hmm. there are products like this that we have been also involving in uh, to uh, take advantage of science worldwide and adapting it. And of course, the secret of our success is huge numbers, high quality, at low price. And uh, that's what, uh, when I was asked a question in, in a Gavi meeting by Seth Berkeley, who finally endowed me with a Vaccine Hero Award, said, how do you do that, Dr. Punala? Give a price of a cup of tea for the vaccines all over the world without compromising the quality. Right. That's mm -hmm. a very important thing. GMP, quality, anything. And I said, it's the numbers game. To take the risk of making a vaccine uh, much more than WHO, UNICEF, POWER, and United States and other uh, countries had predicted. For example, they said, we need 100 million doses of vaccine. I had the vision of making 400 million doses capacity. And they said this lunatic 
How is he able to do it? The press asked me and I said, look, except my son, I have nobody to answer to. I'm taking the risk in public interest. I know seeing so much ahead that one day you'll need four times what is predicted. And that's just what happened to eradicate measles, catch up campaigns. And the campaign to give measles and MR and MR vaccine between the age of not only one and two years, but up to 18 years. You needed so much four or five times the predicted quantity, which nobody in the world could imagine that we'd need 400 million doses, which we are producing every year of measles and MMR vaccine for protecting and eradicating this disease. I hope it goes, even though it'll be a hole in my pocket at yeah. the end of the day. But uh, what I'm working is for public health. Yeah. So, so speaking of vision, I mean, obviously your vision early on um, led you to where you are today, but can you tell us how your vision evolved over the six decades you've been working on vaccine development? And what were some of the early challenges you faced when you were just starting out? And how have these challenges changed, um, if at all? And what are the challenges that you're facing now? All right, it's a very good question. Uh, it's a story of my life when I keep complaining to the government of India. When we started, you won't believe it, we didn't have pure, good quality of water, electrical connections for starting the, the, the company, uh, inadequate road and transport, all the basic uh, issues. And uh, in fact, I had to grab some connections of <laughs> electricity for which I was charged for illegal taking power, but uh, I, I got that regularized uh, later on. And that was a very, very interesting story. And the challenges were immense. The uh, regulatory authorities uh, didn't know whether they were coming or going in that time. And there was bureaucracy, paperwork, months and months, even as late uh, as about uh, uh, two decades ago, it was impossible to get regulatory permissions. Uh, uh, but now things have completely changed. They have seen the, the, the difference between uh, red tape and dynamism. The present government has been extremely dynamic and we're getting our permissions soon. We're getting our international recognitions and pre-qualification. Also, in, in, in 1992, when I had gone to WHO for a pre-Q of a measles vaccine. The inspectors came with, uh, you know, uh, a mind that, hey, are we going to see any snakes coming around uh, when we <laughs> approach the Institute uh, right driveway? I'm telling you, it is a serious question they asked me. And, and today they're so forthcoming that they've got so much confidence that as soon as we send up uh, papers for PQ, say for a pneumonia vaccine just now, we, within a, a few weeks, we were uh, on board. And uh, we, we, the same, same encouragement is being given to us now uh, for making a vaccine for uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. And that's going to help us immensely to, uh, to move forward. Uh, then the uh, days uh, gone by where it was a real struggle, as I've explained, from A to Z. And of course, most important, qualified staff. In those days, it was very difficult to get qualified staff. And now there's an abundance of it. They, I must uh, admit here and now that all the qualified staff that I co collected that time are still with me for 30, 40 years. None of them have decided to migrate except maybe one or two, of course. And, uh, and that's helped us to build up a team, not only of dedicated scientists, but those who have gone through the mill. And they haven't, you know, in every other country I feel if after four or five years, they change. So the whole uh, training imparted on a particular specialized vaccine is mm -hmm. lost, so which we haven't done here. And that's been a great strength for us uh, today. Um, you, you touched on this a little bit before, um, but can you, I, I just have to ask the question um, as to how you manage to uh, manufacture so many vaccines at scale, and as you say, at high quality, you never compromise uh, the quality, but you also can provide them at affordable prices. How, how do you do it? 
<laughs> yes, well, that 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 is obviously a, a huge management screen uh, um, uh, talent. Where what we are, as I said, we are moving ahead of time, and yeah. if we are seeing a situation now, for example, I give it to you as a recent example. We are uh, making facilities which we needn't have done or not planned uh, for futuristic. Uh, availability of manufacturing GMP facilities. So today we have got, say, another hundreds of millions of filling lines uh, capacity ready. As soon as our COVID vaccine gets developed, we can move in it. Even AstraZeneca, if I may say so candidly, won't be able to do uh, 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 what we can do to give these uh, vaccines available because of uh, visionary advanced planning uh -huh. and public company cannot do this because they have to answer to the shareholders if it fails whereas we don't have a shareholder so we can take the advantage and the courage to plan out say today we have already started filling in anticipation of mm -hmm. a pre-qualified vaccine hundreds of uh, millions of doses uh, maybe at least uh, 50 million per month without getting a license show on a, a basis of discard the vaccine or submit it for license show if the product passes the clinical trials. Those are big risks though that you're taking, correct? Yes, huge, yes. huge calculated risk with a certain amount of calculated uh, uh, profit loss. But the main thing is I'm doing it on humanitarian grounds, not to make money anymore <laughs> from 25, uh, thousand uh, dollars we're already uh, over 10 billion instead of being 20 billion if we wanted to exploit the market but having said that the idea is that we can come to the rescue of humanity mm -hmm. by taking this huge risk and diverting even other profitable products for a product like COVID-19 vaccine and so on and this we have done for, uh, for many products, it's not only for this. When there was an epidemic of X, Y, or Z vaccine and uh, the, uh, the UNICEF and all were terribly short, even of pentavalent or measles or, uh, or whatever other vaccines that we're making, we've been able to divert some of our uh, state-of-art plants which were made in anticipation of a global demand. That's the secret of, uh, uh, of, of uh, abundance of production availability and also scientists that we had motivated and trained up to rise to the occasion. Mm -hmm. and, and remind me, so all your vaccines are made in India, is that correct? Yeah, except uh, uh, ITV uh, where yeah. we are not allowed because of uh, restrictions as you know on uh, polio uh, facilities that uh, uh, you know, only Europe can be, have been cleared, the developing world have not been cleared for polio essential facility for containment. And uh -huh. so we bought a plant in Holland mm -hmm. to make the IPV, which we are doing there. And uh -huh. uh, with, in keeping with my global policy of being the world leader on all uh, number of doses of vaccines, not the world mm -hmm. leader and uh, like Glaxo would be for other things that we are setting up a plant which will give us more than a hundred million doses very soon uh, uh, to make uh, IPV available and a, a, a quad, say, hexavalent vaccine, which would be the ultimate cure for developing world where they can take in one shot, six in one, including mm -hmm. an IPV. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. So if I could, um, let's switch back to COVID for a minute. And can you tell me when you realized uh, the severity of the disease and the impact it would have in India as well as around the world? And um, have you faced a scourge of, of similar magnitude? COVID. Yeah. Yes, we were quite early on the uptake, uh, a, a, as early as January itself. And my friend Adrian Hill in, in Oxford I, we contacted him early on and followed up uh, uh, the Oxford University's uh, progress of the vaccine uh, very early and we got our act together uh, and we wanted them to give us the technology and training 
uh, even anticipate without anticipating such a huge uh, uh, offtake. Uh, so we've been in touch right from the beginning, much before many other manufacturers got into the game, and therefore we've got a head start, and uh, uh, we've got uh, the technology from them. Though I think for some reasons they were had to go with AstraZeneca and give us a sub license. Uh, but having said that, uh, both AstraZeneca and Oxford University will be extremely cooperative with us. Uh -huh. And that's why we've got a uh, manufacturing base from, uh, from uh, not getting just bulk, but making the vaccine here ourselves. And our clinical trials uh, in phase two, phase three are, are going on very strongly in, in, in India. Uh, mm -hmm. We have also got a tie up with uh, uh, the uh, company which I had unfortunately to sell off our pra polio essential facility in, in uh, Prague and uh, um, they, they are Novavax and they are also very uh, much got a lot of faith in us and they've given us the technology to also make it for uh, in large numbers. I think we'll be <laughs> hopefully ahead of my erstwhile company in Prague because they have to go to a lot of GMP requirements and we are already on board with a world-class GMP facility uh, uh, in our new plant next door where uh, we have made uh, huge investments in filling lines, production lines, two, the two, many 2,000, 3,000 liter capacity fermenters and train staff to rise to the occasion. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me um, a little bit about the challenges um, that the Institute is facing in, in um, uh, producing mass quantities of the coronavirus uh, vaccine? And are the challenges any different for this particular um, uh, virus than other viruses? No, in fact, it's the other way around. Uh, at the moment, we have faced no challenges. Uh, it looks a relatively straightforward production. It's the challenges that we had gone, uh, you know, neck deep to uh, overcome in making uh, other vaccines like pneumonia and so on. That has helped us a lot to adapt to making uh, a vaccine for uh, COVID-19. Uh, and, and I think uh, we have found it uh, quite easy Having said that, I must be honest with you, it looks all hunky dory now, but uh -huh. we're really going to make the vaccine successful. If we don't, then there'll be the real challenge to see where we or the world has gone wrong and what we need to modify in the process. Uh, as it is, as Oxford has started with the dream of a one dose vaccine, they've gone to two dose schedule, mm -hmm. and we don't know what sort of uh, immune response and protected protection levels they'll attain. Uh, we're getting very good, excellent results uh, with the Novavax vaccine. Um, and of course, that'll follow much later than the Oxford vaccine, but you'd be happy to hear we are facing no resistance at the moment in making a huge quantities or huge numbers of uh, uh, the vaccine for COVID, uh, especially since this is going to be done uh, and we're going to fill it mostly in 10 dose containers. So uh -huh. instead of filling, say, 10 million doses uh, in single dose containers, which Europe would want, we are filling in 10 doses. So we get 100 million out on the same production mm -hmm. line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this speaks to a little bit um, of my next question, and that is um, uh, uh, the supply chain management, uh, not just of COVID vaccines, but of all life saving, saving vaccines you've produced. And can you tell us a little bit more or give us a peek into how this supply chain management actually works? Huh. <laughs> this is your well, secret, right? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, the, we have, uh, luckily, we, we, we were uh, emphasized for by uh, uh, UNICEF that whole chain was very important from, from day one. So we have worked out uh, uh, the process of uh, developing... Uh, the packaging and uh, other infrastructure facilities for dispatch uh, of, with uh, dry eyes and uh, cold chain monitors uh, 
so that we don't get uh, a vaccine returned to us because of uh, uh, inadequate facility and infrastructure. So we have built it up. You see, for that, it was over a period of, let's say, 30, 40 years that we could slowly develop our uh, cold chain facilities. And mm -hmm. therefore, we, we don't have uh, an issue on the dispatch. And the second thing is that we dispatching huge numbers and hope to do that for COVID vaccine to the uh, the, the, uh, the uh, procurement agency, say UNICEF, PAHO, even government of India. Then it becomes their responsibility, which we have been saved of, of actually sending the vaccine in uh, 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 fragmented uh, containers to the end user. Mm. So uh, to be honest with you, that headache is been passed on mainly to the bulk purchasers or government or whatever if we, we supply the vaccine to X or Y government then it becomes their responsibility uh, after seeing that the vaccine cold monitor uh, cold chain monitors are valid then our delivery problem ends at that issue sure sure but you get it to that point and experience yeah. counts for a lot <laughs> yeah. Um, so as public health professionals, what worries us a lot is the possibility that the world is entering a dangerous new age of emerging infectious diseases, um, and COVID-19, obviously, in his example. So can you tell us what um, we must do at a global policy level to prepare for this eventuality? And specifically, what are the challenges and opportunities in uh, development of vaccines? new vaccines? Actually, that is a more question for the regulators or uh, the planning people to advise. Uh, I am a hardcore uh, scale up, low cost, high quality yeah. vaccine manufacturer. So I'm afraid I can't tell you much on it. But as I, the only thing that they should extrapolate is, is what we've done is that they should be ahead of time. They, they, they have come to one epidemic now, like there was in the case of SARS, you know, where as soon as the epidemic died, the uh, international agencies who had promised hundreds of millions of dollars to us and other companies to make a uh, 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 facility for manufacturing immediately uh, uh, if an epidemic came. Mm -hmm. They said that it was the right thing, but when the things cooled off, uh, memories are short and they didn't go ahead with the funding yeah. and they didn't persevere the, the plan. So my uh, advice to the world is that having learned a, a lesson, this time we should not make a mistake and spend some hundreds of millions of dollars or in a country like India, you probably won't need more than a 50 or 100 million dollars to put up a state of art facility, make it qualified have it GMP regulated, which takes nine months technically to, uh, you know, pre-qualify the product for its integrity and so on, and keep it ready in case mm -hmm. something, no, nobody dreamt of this disease. So if some other disease comes, are you going to start uh, inventing the wheel around or keep it ready and go? And yeah. it's a very small amount for the world to invest a few hundred million dollars staggered in three or four countries to uh, press the button when the war is on and not then try to build up an army to fight the war. Yeah, great, great advice. And I hope the world listens to you this time um, and we don't make the same mistake. So let me switch gears a little bit. And um, as an educator, I'm always looking for insight into the pursuit of knowledge and impactful careers. And clearly your, your career has been enormously in, uh, impactful. Can you tell us what are what are you proudest of, both um, professionally as well as personally, in your career? <laughs> All right, and I think the one was uh, very recently when I was being uh, awarded the uh, uh, vaccine hero of the world by Seth Berkeley in in, in a Kavi. Uh, uh, meeting recently but i think the main main uh, earlier proud moment was when uh, in a developing country like india we were the first to get pre-qualified and recognized by 
WHO and subsequently UNICEF and all that our vaccine is uh, approved and can be supplied globally. I think that was a major breakthrough, major proud moment. And uh, uh, then of course, uh, the uh, uh, all the other accolades that followed uh, one after the other, uh, getting honorary degrees in Massachusetts and Oxford, but and the glo global vaccine hero. Uh, yes, I do recollect one of the other very, very proud moment was when Mr. Gates came to India a decade ago and declared that I was one of the world's seven vaccine heroes. Uh, so <laughs> that was yeah. a great shot in the arm, uh, which I must appreciate. Yes. Uh -huh. And of Many course, this, this does give you a great uh, encouragement to leave commercial uh, considerations and work more for humanity in whichever product you want to do by uh, giving free vaccines to Africa and many mm -hmm. underdeveloped uh, states in India and uh, uh, so, uh, to resist the temptation of doubling the price uh, for measles and also for COVID. I'm sure I'll be able to keep the COVID price down for the world uh, as far as I can, uh, even if the opportunity is there for making money. I, we, we, my son and myself have vowed to uh, uh, keep up the same uh, policy till we can mm -hmm. afford it. Yeah. And we are so grateful for your generosity. It's amazing. Thank um, you. So can you give, there are many, many people listening to this uh, interview who are aspiring public health uh, heroes like yourself. What advice would you give young public health professionals as they embark on their careers? Oh, well, that's another good question. Um, they have to be dedicated from the beginning, and though everybody claims to be dedicated, but they have to be really dedicated work uh, beyond the uh, 12, 18 or eight, I mean, eight or 12 hours and uh, not change jobs to uh, upgrade their uh, careers or salary purposes, but stay committed to a product at least till it sees its logical end and that they can show some achievement in their uh, faculty and their production lines where they're working, um, which is going to finally give them the benefit of being satisfied that they achieve something in life and not look at only monetary gains or personal upgradation of their career uh, with the initial success. Yes, and you are an inspiration to many of those young public health. I, I don't know, I, 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 they, so they say, but uh, I've been very lucky that I've been able uh -huh. to climb up to the ladder where I never dreamt I'd be. Uh, and I hope that some other individuals are even more fortunate than I've been in life so far. Good. So let me end with a question. Um, I know you're, you're well known for your contributions to vaccines, um, but I also know that you have supported many other um, uh, 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 causes uh, in your life. Can you tell us a little bit about the contributions you've made that are not related to vaccines, but to society more generally? Well, many years ago, my vice president, Dr. Uh, Jal Mehta, was working on leprosy. And uh -huh. he persuaded me to join as the vice president of the Pune uh, District Leprosy Committee. And I donated a, a, a center there for not helping the leprosy patients medically, but to rehabilitate them. This is a very important uh, project that we embarked on in my earlier days where the person could get cured for leprosy and then he'd be thrown on the street. So he needed uh, employment and therefore we put up a, a, a small unit or engineering unit where he could be employed gainfully and he would not uh, get overcome the stigma of leprosy and be involved in manufacturing of engineering products which we then persuaded some big engineering companies like the Tata Group 
who kindly agreed to do, take those products and uh, sustain the thing. Uh, recently, of course, my son has embarked on clean Pune city where we have got uh, 250 uh, uh, vans which we are cleaning up the city and using that waste to make fuel so that we kill two birds with one stone and the, the, we hope that other people will take up this uh, uh, project uh, also. Um, mm -hmm. You've asked this question, I'm just trying to think. These were the two major things besides, uh, you know, uh, we're running a hospital now where we're charging, what is it, 400 rupees, that's what, five, six dollars a room night. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, things like that, that would uh, help the country. But uh, also, yes, uh, I, my main dream would be to punish corrupt uh, officials in the country, which I can't do because my hands are tied because of retaliation, if I may say so. Mm -hmm. uh, and But what we are doing is we are trying to get uh, the rape victims in our country. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, punished and brought to book. And I strongly believe that uh, it, atrocities against uh, women uh, uh, who have uh, uh, got more uh, symp lip sympathizers than those who really put their hand out. Uh, I'm trying to support the women's clause, um, uh, not for women's lip, but for atrocities against women, which mm -hmm. is uh, horrible and uh, needs immediate attention. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Um, a big challenge, a huge challenge. Huge challenge, huge challenge with uh, people giving only lip sympathy and not, uh, you know, standing up for the cause when the uh, shove comes to push. Yeah. Well, Dr. Punwala, um, it's amazing. You have impacted uh, the lives of millions of people around the world, especially, of course, children. Um, so for all you have done and all you continue to do, um, I am honored to bestow upon you the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Dean's Medal for 2020. And I do look forward to seeing you in May um, this coming year, all vaccinated up um, so that we're able to um, be in person so that I can personally bestow upon you this, this great honor. Well, Your work. I accept it with great humility and uh, I, I, I'm really deeply honored uh, that uh, your uh, institute thought of bestowing this with me uh, voluntarily without me reaching out or doing anything uh, to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, make my achievements known. And I really look forward to uh, meeting all of you in, in May. And, and with you as well. Thank you so very much. And let me just end by saying the work you do exemplifies um, the mission of our school of uh, improving uh, health and saving lives, millions, or I should say billions at a time. You are a true public health hero of the world. And I say that with all sincerity. And thank you for, again, for all you do. And thank you um, in particular for spending some time with us. I know you're very busy um, and we appreciate the time you were able to give us uh, uh, today. So thank you. And we look forward to seeing you in May. Thank you once again. Bye-bye. Yep.